Very own pastor. Today's topic is is God appointment. Part two from Genesis twenty nine verse thirty one to chapter thirty verse twenty. All right. Thank you, Edward, and uh, so good to see so many of you back in church. A good morning to you. And I hope you've got your Bibles with you. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 29. We're going around this passage a second time today. And I can safely say that many of you probably have not read through it. And uh, even if you want to read it, it is half reading. But nonetheless, it holds so much. It holds so much precious things that God would want to say to us. It is part two of a topic which began in our last study some six weeks ago. The first part was Jacob's disappointment. If you look at this passage, it was, he was thoroughly disappointed. But God can turn it into his appointment. And that's what we're going to see today. So, with the Bibles open, and uh, today, we're going to depend on a lot on this PowerPoint. And if you cannot see, come forward. If you're at the side, you may want to move to the center. If you can't see the PowerPoint, that would be a problem. So, make the move quickly, and then we can begin. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we want to thank you again this morning that we're all here because of your grace and your love. We just want to ask this morning that as we you quieten our heart, Help us to set aside the things that's been bugging us this whole week so that we can focus and sit at your feet to hear your voice. So that, Lord, we will walk away from this place totally refreshed, energized by you and you alone. And we want to be more and more like you. And truly, that's our desire. And we want to ask this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Genesis chapter 29, and we'll be looking at verses 31 right through to verse 24 of the following chapter. And in our last study, these 29 verses describe for us a nightmarish period of Jacob's life during which he was cheated many times by his father-in-law, Uncle Laban. And then he went on to father 11 sons with his four wives. And all that time, he was caught in between the two sisters, Leah and Rachel, because both of them were slinging insults at each other. Sisters, grew up together, fighting over one man. Jacob's family life was in a chaos. And certainly, he was thoroughly disappointed. But all this were his own doing. Because he was stubborn and foolish. And that led him into a polygamous lifestyle. But despite the mess that Jacob has gotten himself into, yet today we're going to see how God is going to turn his disappointment into God's appointment. And the question is, how? How is God going to do that? We'll come back to that later. But first, let me a little bit on the subject of 
polygamy. And we need to be clear that God never allowed polygamy. It is a sin. And today, even in our evangelical churches, there are people who are walking around thinking that polygamy is okay for some people because it's in the Bible. Take a look. It is a sin. God clearly says that a marriage is between a man and a woman and they are to remain, remain monogamous. There are many verses that speaks to that. Genesis chapter 2, 24, in the NASB translation, it reads, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. God did not say, For this reason a man shall leave his father and future father-in-laws, father-in-laws, and be joined to his wives. God didn't say wives. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, same thing. God clearly said, however, each one of you also must love his wife. God never said, love his wives. If you have more, love your wives. God didn't say that. You can read that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 also. Back to our story. Jacob was madly in love with Rachel. But he married, he had to marry Leah. And one week later, he also married Rachel. And now with two wives, we are told that after, after having two wives, in chapter 29, verse 30, that Jacob started to feel a sense of hatred for Leah. It wasn't that kind of hatred like he wants to murder her although it may have crossed his mind. But it's, it's a sense of strong dislike toward Leah. Why? Because now there's comparison. There are two. So in comparison, it felt like he's, he hated Leah. And this, this is the problem with polygamy because God has created us in such a way that our heart can only accommodate one person at a time. You cannot be in love with two people at the same time. You see, being in love and being married to your spouse is not just about physical attraction or about sex. But true love is about living in a giving and caring relationship for life, for life. You don't change partners every three months. But we may like to think that we can. And even the world will tell us that we can. And psychologists can produce studies to show that an extramarital affair can be healthy for your marriage because it keeps it vibrant. It keeps it vibrant. You're alive. Why are you alive? Because you're running from your wife, afraid of getting caught. That's why you, you, have, this, you have this excitement until you get caught. Check out the A&E department here in the hospital. There are many men with broken limbs. No, I'm just kidding. But you will pay. You will pay very, very heavily. But we know that this is not love. It is just last. And we're all giving in to our perverted sexual drives and justifying our warped, twisted thinking. And today, you can see this perverted lifestyle in the Mormon community, 
especially there is a certain sect of it where they would teach that multiple wives can harmoniously live together to serve one husband without jealousy. And that's utterly nonsense. It is not true because every single one of those wives, if you have seen some of these reality shows, they don't want to share their husband. But those wives were merely tolerating each other. One thing to just send the frying pan over the other woman's head. And today, the head of this Mormon sect, <clears throat> you might have heard of him some years back, he was arrested, Warren Jeffs. He married many teenage girls. And at the time he started out, he had about 20 over wives. But when he was arrested, he had 78. And today he's sitting in jail until 2038. He probably will come out in a box. And it was all because he was sexually abusing all these young girls. So, polygamy, or today, you might have heard of this thing called wife swapping. It's happening here in Singapore. Wife swapping or wife sharing, like car sharing kind, you know? You book and then you, you, you just take it out for a few hours or any other forms of perverted sexual relationships will destroy you. It's fun for a little while, but it will eventually destroy you. Because God in the Bible tells us that it cannot be done outside of what is already ordained and designed by God. And what is that? Marriage. Marriage is between one man and one woman for life. But from these stories that we have read so far, from these accounts that we have read so far in Genesis, we look at the life of Abraham, Isaac, and even David. Some of us may be tempted to think that despite all their mistakes, their life stories actually ended pretty well. That this flawed reasoning of ours may even lead us to conclude that all our sins are actually part of God's will. Have you ever thought of that? It is part of God's will. God forbid. That is from the devil. Yes, it is true that their lives ended well, but it is all because of the sovereignty of God. And God in His sovereignty can work with flawed men. And He works around all our sins and failures. And then caused something good to come out of it. And God is able to do that because He is God. And we are all flawed. How many of you are flawed? All of us. And God is still working with us, working in and through us. We find that in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3. Isaiah 61, verse 3. In the King James Version, it tells us that to appoint unto them, God appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, in Jerusalem, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. For some reason, they all have got problems. And their lives were a pile of ashes. But God can turn it into beauty, something beautiful. That's God. That's our God. And He'll, he'll give us joy for mourning and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So the question we might ask ourselves is, what does the sovereignty of God mean in practice, in real life? How does it look like? 
we've talked about this before, but I think we need to talk about it again so that you become so clear in your mind. What is the sovereignty of God? What does it mean? What does it look like to live out the sovereignty of God in my life and in your life? So this is how it looks like. If you and I were walking in step with Jesus, say, for example, we are walking in step in obedience, and if you're living by faith and obeying the commands of Jesus, then whatever bad things that happen to you, you can know that it is from God if you are living in obedience. Because we all like to have good things happening to us. But good things does happen to bad people. Uh, good, bad things does happen to good people. Even if you're living in obedience. So make sure that you're not suffering for your own sin. If you are suffering for your own sin or the stupidity of your own actions, then you deserve it. You deserve it. But the big question is, can you accept bad things? And you may say, why must I accept bad things? Because I don't understand it. I'm doing everything right. And it is because God is sovereign. He has his own plan and he has his own purpose. And he knows best how to achieve his plan. And he will do it. Whatever it takes to fulfill his plan. That's God. And the history of our world today is moving toward that direction. His plan will come to pass. It is his appointment. But we may not like it. And it becomes our disappointment, just as it was for Jacob. But if you choose to trust, if you choose to please God, to do whatever is right in the sight of God, even though your flesh screams, No! No! This is what it means to allow God to have absolute control, to be sovereign over your life and my life. It means that you fit into God's plan, not the other way around. God does not fit into your plan. Then and only then you will receive God's best, His first price, so to speak, because it is his appointment. So, with this understanding of the sovereignty of God in our mind, let's look at the flawed life of Jacob. And we ask the question, if God had wanted Jacob to have the birthright, you remember he stole the birthright from Esau? If God had wanted Jacob to have the birthright instead of Esau, can God caused that to happen without his help or the scheming and the deception of Jacob and Rebekah, can that happen? The answer is yes. Or if we ask, if it is God's will for Jacob to have 12 sons so that they will form the nation of Israel, can God enable Leah and Leah alone to produce 12 sons? And again, the answer is yes. Because there's no reason for us to doubt that this same God who opened Sarah's dead womb has difficulty in enabling Leah to have 12 sons. How many of you know of people with 12 children? Nobody. I do. All right, 
more than 12. Because I've told you before, one of my grand auntie, she started naming the, the children with numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And after eight, she, she did not call nine. Then she called uh, last. And then last, final. And final is people one more, you know. And it went on and on. All right. So there you have it. Our God is greater. But the diff more difficult question is this. How do we know that Leah was God's only choice? How do we know? And we see proof of that in the two sons of Leah, Levi and Judah. One, Levi came to be the tribe, came the tribe of the priests. And Judah came the tribe of the kings from which we have the Messiah, the promised seed. And this is clear indication that she was God's choice, while Rachel wasn't. But this is not to say that Rachel and her two sons are not important to God's redemption plan. They are, which will become obvious later on in our studies. God could have accomplished all his plans through Leah, but Jacob wasn't contented with God's plan because she's not the one Jacob wanted. And Leah became the unloved one. And ironically, Jacob has forgotten that he too was at one time the unloved son and his family because his father Isaac was determined to overlook Jacob and favor Esau even though Jacob was the one God had chosen. And now we find Jacob committing the same sin his father Isaac did by rejecting the wife God has chosen for him so that he can favor the woman of his own choosing. And now, God must teach Jacob a huge lesson, that he must fit into God's plan. And God is about to break Jacob. And Jacob will experience God's power and authority as he turns Jacob's disappointment into God's appointment. And we asked the question earlier, how? How is God going to do that? We know from our previous study that Jacob's life, his personal life and his family life were completely dysfunctional and chaotic. And if you remember, we had this chart and we filled up only the second column, which is only half of our study. We'll be looking at the other half. And I did pose to you a quiz question, which nobody attempted. Nobody. And I don't blame you, because I don't see anything in it for me to. And the question was this, what event was God describing? by the birth of the 12th son. What was this event? And if we were to compare all the reasons that both Leah and Rachel gave when the sons were born, and we compare the keywords or the passages or the sequences, we find that the birth of these 12 sons actually prophesied, prophesied the birth of the nation of Israel from the time they left Egypt to the time they entered the promised land of Canaan. And that's the amazing thing we're going to see today as we compare the keywords that both Leah and Rachel uttered. It will outline for us 
Having left Egypt, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. And then under Joshua, they conquered Canaan. And this is not the first time that we see in the book of Genesis that God used names in genealogies, prophecies, typologies, and events to predict the future of God's calendar. It is all embedded there. And if I were to quickly compress everything that you are going to see, or we have seen, we have seen the first four up to Ishmael. Today we'll be looking at this, the birth of 12 sons. And later on in the rest of Genesis, we're going to see that God is unpacking. God is revealing his detailed plan of redemption. Amazing. And we look at genealogies and we say, oh man, how boring. What a waste of time. But yet, we find God giving us clues as to what's going to happen in the future. So if we were to look at this list, it is God's redemption plan. Starting with Noah, starting with Noah, the genealogy of Noah. And then we've, we've seen the genealogy of, of Keturah and Ishmael, including the typology of Isaac and Rebekah. They all point to major events that is happening. From the rapture to the millennium, and then finally, the destruction of the whole world through, through the period which we call the final rebellion and then the great white throne judgment. And today from uh, Genesis 29 onwards, God is going to unpack for us his redemption plan through the 12 sons of Jacob. And if we look at this, right up to chapter 49 and 50, we have the prophecy of Jacob on his 12 sons. And we think that's the end. That's not the end. The final end will come in the prophecy concerning the 144,000. That's how God is going to bring the world to an end. So, um, don't try to copy this. If you want, the PowerPoints are on the computer here and Tokwai will be happy to send them to you. <clears throat> Let me just quickly flash out to you the, the sequence of the um, this birth. There's a, this is the example. And I'll just give you an example of what we have already done with the genealogy of Noah, from Adam to Noah. And if you pick up all the keywords, the gospel is given here clearly, so clear that we must die. But a day is coming. The Messiah is coming. All right? So, as we look at the nation of Israel, the birth, and it will end up in chapter 49 with what Israel would look like in the end time. And when we get to chapter 49, you will understand what's happening in Gaza today. You will, you will understand. And the good news is it is going to get worse. And you and I don't like it because it disrupts our life. Even though we are far, far away, but God tells us it is going to happen to the nation of Israel in the end time. Each Sunday, as you and I come here, and as we open the pages of the Bible together, and I hope that as you and I see the Word of God, the amazing mind of God embedding His messages in seemingly boring names and of people and places. 
you and I will be convinced that every single word that we find, even in today's genealogy, is inspired. It is inspired. Uh, this, this is the timeline which uh, we are here in the church age. One day the rapture will happen and then immediately we'll find a period of seven years of tribulation where the whole world, if you're still alive, you'll go through a very difficult time. The Antichrist will control the whole world. But that's when midway through, the nation of Israel will realize that Jesus is the Messiah. And then you'll go through a second period where the Antichrist will persecute the nation of Israel. We call that the Greater Tribulation. At the end of seven years, Jesus will come again a second time. We call that the second coming. And that will lead on to 1,000 years when Jesus will rule on earth in Jerusalem. We call that the millennium. And at the end of the millennium, there will be the final battle between God and Satan. And then eternity begins. Eternity begins. It is an exciting period. We are almost, we're almost here. The question is, are you happy about it? Some of us are not because we still haven't enjoyed life enough. I haven't been to Hawaii to play golf yet. That's my dream. All right. Uh, I keep praying, Lord, wait until I go to Hawaii. Then after that, you can come. All right. But we fit into his plan. He doesn't fit into ours. And when we see the end times coming, and as God unpacks all this in the pages of the Bible, we will be convinced <clears throat> that even through genealogy like this, nothing is trivial. Nothing is meaningless. And that's why we are looking at this, the, the, the births of the 12 sons. We are looking at the order of their births. We are looking at the meaning of their births, at their names. And then we are looking at the reason, the reason for their names and that's what we're going to do now because they are huge we're going to see god's hand moving and he's going to show us the significance in the text and as i've said we will use king james version for the sake of comparison so that there is consistency right it is in king james version so let's begin we have seen this chart already and I'm going to go through the second column very quickly because we have done it before. Beginning with Reuben and Simeon, verses 32 and 33 of Genesis chapter 29. At their births, Leah said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. And then at the birth of Simeon, Leah said, because the Lord hath heard that I was hated. 400 years later, after their birth, when we compare what God said about the Israelites when they were in Egypt, look at what God said. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 25. Exodus chapter 2, verse 25. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Then he said again in verse 7 of Exodus chapter 3, I have seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry. Now all these words that's highlighted in yellow, those red letters highlighted in yellow, they are the same Hebrew word. The same Hebrew word. And you beat that? That's the beginning when God saw the suffering and heard their cries of the Israelites. And then God called them to leave Egypt. And they are to get out of Egypt into the wilderness. Next, we look at the birth of Levi. 
when in verse 34, Leah said, Now this is the time my husband be joined unto me. And we know that even though Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go, but it was only at the tenth plague. When God redeemed the Israelites, God redeemed the Israelites at the Passover. And in that redemption, it symbolizes that God has bought Israel with the blood of the Lamb. And God was joined to Israel and became her husband when they were at Mount Sinai. We see that in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 and 32. And that all happened at the Passover night. Israel was redeemed and the marriage was formalized at Mount Sinai. Then when Judah was born, Leah said, Now will I praise the Lord. Now will I praise the Lord. Judah means praise. And after the Israelites have been redeemed, brought out, bought by the blood of lamb, God was able to deliver the nation of Israel across the Red Sea out of the reach of Pharaoh. Remember, being bought or redeemed is quite different from being delivered. You can redeem, but you need to have the power to deliver. And God had that power when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. And there we find in Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, the second part. They sang this song of praise. Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Who is like thee? No one, he answered. So having crossed the Red Sea, the Israelites sang praises to God. Notice the sequence. Notice the sequence. Right? It's all in perfect sequence. Now we move to Genesis chapter 30, verses 1 to 8, when Rachel's maid, Bilhah, gave birth to two sons, Dan and Naphtali. Naphtali. And at the birth of Dan, Rachel said, God hath judged me and hath also heard my voice. And at the birth of Naphtali, Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali. Both names. Both names describe that period of Israel history when the Israelites were in the wilderness. And when we look at the first name, we realize that in Exodus chapter 16, God judged the Israelites because they murmured they murmured because there was no water and no food. You remember they asked for meat. They were sick and tired of eating the manna, which is like bread, like a wafer. And they were murmuring against God. And God judged them. God killed them. Many of them died. You can read that in Numbers 11. Verse 33, Numbers 11. <clears throat> and then again, we find that they were murmuring later on about water. And that was the second time when Moses struck the rock. And in Numbers 17, they murmured against God when God appointed Aaron and his family and the other Levites were saying, what's so great about 
Aaron. You don't, you don't question God. But God appointed Aaron and his family to be the priests. And then later, in the case of Naphtali, it describes the time when the Israelites were fighting the Amalekites. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 11. That's the time we read when Moses raised up his hand. The Israel prevailed. But when Moses' hand was let down, the Amalekites prevailed. So that's the period of their history in the wilderness. In the wilderness. After which we move on to the next stage. And we read in Genesis chapter 30 verses 11 and 13. The baby making competition. You remember the baby making competition. It picks up steam. And Leah now threw in her maid, Zilpah. And Zilpah gave birth to two sons, Gad and Asher. And when Gad was born, Leah said, a troop cometh. That means help is coming. And when Asher was born, Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. Asher means happy. But in the history of Israel, after crossing the river Jordan, you would remember when they crossed the river Jordan, they were met by seven Canaanite nations. The troop came to attack Israel. But the Canaanites were defeated, giving Israel joy. They had joy. Later on, after this, Leah herself gave birth to two more sons. Issachar and Zebulun. When Issachar was born, Leah said, God has given me my hire or my reward. And when Zebulun was born, Leah said, God has given me a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me. Leah was confident that now she will have Jacob all to herself. Compare that to the history of Israel. These two names describe the period after the conquest of Canaan, when Israel was rewarded and they dwelt safely in the land that God had promised to Abraham. And this brings us to the 10th and the last son born to Leah and the two maids. Next, we're going to look at the other two sons from Rachel. But notice that there was a gap, a brick between Leah and the two maids and Rachel, suggesting that their births would point us to a separate period of Israel's history. After Joshua, and many years later, we have kings in Israel, and these are the days of David and Solomon. And this new kingdom period is separated from the early history of Israel's conquest under Joshua. And after Joshua, you remember the judges, the judges ruled Israel for a period. So from the time of Joshua to the time of David and Solomon, it is a period of four to five hundred years. It is that, that alone. That period is now beginning with the kingdom age. So when it was God's timing for Rachel to have children, she gave birth to 
Joseph and in verse 23 of chapter 30, Rachel said, God hath taken away my reproach. Meaning that with the birth of Joseph, Rachel said that the Lord has taken away her disgrace. Her disgrace for being childless. And if you compare that to the history of Israel, strangely, when Israel entered Canaan, led by Joshua, this is what God said to Joshua. In Joshua chapter 5, verse 9. Joshua chapter 5, verse 9. The Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I wrote away the reproach of Egypt from you. It means that God has taken away the disgrace of the nation of Israel during their 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Now that's a disgrace, don't you think? If you have been slaves before, you wouldn't want to admit that, would you? Ask the Aussies today, who are their forefathers? They, many of them would rather not tell you because many of their forefathers were actually criminals that England doesn't want and they were all shipped to Australia. So this is exactly the same. God says, I've taken away your disgrace. And now that Israel, having conquered and securely living in Canaan, the promised land given in the Abrahamic covenant, from that point on, in the history of Israel, the nation of Israel was born. And they will be able to call themselves a nation, a kingdom under a king. And that was David. And that period of Israel's history was actually, and end Solomon was called the golden age, the golden age of Israel. Now that the Israelites are safely dwelling in Canaan as one united kingdom with one king, David, but Rachel did not stop there. Rachel continued to say in verse 24 of Genesis chapter 30, verse 24 reads, she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son the Lord shall add to me another son. The name Joseph means he shall add, he shall add. And Rachel said that God not only took away her disgrace, but she prayed. She prayed that God will add to her another son. And we do know that six years later, in Genesis chapter 35, Verse 18, Genesis chapter 35, verse 18. She gave birth to a son and she called his name Benoni, Benoni, which means the son of my sorrow, the son of my sorrow, because she was in great pain and she knew she was dying. But the end of verse 18 is very important. It tells us, but his father called him Benjamin, Benjamin, which means the son of my right hand, the son of my right hand. So, after David's rule under Solomon, why was it a period of sorrow? And it's very clear that it was because under Solomon, the kingdom plunged into idolatry. And after the death of Solomon, it was divided. The north, northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. That son that Rachel called the son of my sorrow was Solomon. Because Solomon brought great sorrow to Israel. 
the God was sovereign and is still sovereign. God called him Benjamin. God changed his name. And straight away today we see the parallel. Similarly, God to sent another son. And as God, the humbly father, intervened and named him the son of my right hand. Referring to Jesus. Because when God sent his son, Jesus, to die for the world, to redeem the world, Jesus went to the cross. And today, he sits at the right hand of his father. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 44, the Lord said to my Lord, sit down, sit thou on my right hand. Sit thou on my right hand. So there you have it. From Egypt to Canaan, it is all clearly prophesied. 400 years before it even happened. Can you beat that? Nobody can do that except God. Through all the meaningless words that both Leah and Rachel uttered, it became a great prophecy. And not only that, it prophesied the coming of the Savior. Jesus, whom we'll celebrate next, next Sunday. Notice something else. Take a look. There's a thick red line between Joseph and Benjamin. And that represented the big gap between, uh, of about, that between Joseph and Benjamin. It was about six to seven years apart but it represented the period of 500 years at least between Solomon to the time of the coming of Jesus. When Solomon came, he brought sorrow. But when Jesus came, the righteous king brought life to all of us. And today he sits at the right hand of God. And he will return soon, very soon, to this earth to establish his kingdom. And you and I, we are part of that kingdom. And aren't we excited? Aren't we privileged? So in our study, in our study, we can see and through it all for the rest of Genesis. I hope that you and I can see the sovereignty of God at work in the chaotic lives of Jacob and ours too. And God is able to turn his ashes into joy. Our ashes into joy. Jesus can do the same for us today, for you and me, despite all the evil and the killing and the chaos in our lives or in the world around us today. But how is that going to happen? And that can only happen when you and I first, we must learn to submit to the control of Jesus. Submitting, surrendering to the control of Jesus. And then fitting into his plan. And this would mean that you need to know his plan. You need to know what Jesus is saying. Meaning, we need to get to know Jesus through the pages of the Bible. To hear his voice. And to sit at his feet. You know, I've been in church for more than 50 years of my life. I've seen many people come and go. 
how many more years will you be in church? I don't know. You don't know. But people leave because they're not sitting at the feet of Jesus. They're running their own lives. They're doing Christianity their own way. Not according to what Jesus is saying in the Bible. As I look around, I'm so, you know, encouraged. Many of you are taking time to study the Word. And if you can last one hour here, you are okay. I'm only worried about those who do not care what Jesus has got to say. Or you have heard being taught over this pulpit, but you don't intend to do anything about it. Then your life will turn out to be a Exactly like what Jacob is about to go through. Do you think that Jacob's worst was over? You've got to be kidding. The worst is still to come. The worst is still to come. All right, turn to the person next to you and say, the worst is still is yet to come. Ah, I hate to hear that. Don't you think so? All right, we all love to hear positive things. Positive thing. But for Jacob's life, the worst is yet to come. And your life is going to be like that, like that. If you are like Jacob, trying to obtain God's blessing in his own strength. Not listening to the voice of God. Not sitting at the feet of Jesus. And you may ask, how bad is it going to get? Continue to study with us in our study in Genesis, and God will tell you. But can I urge you, don't mess up your life like Jacob did. And you're going to be surprised. Jacob left his home in Beersheba. At the age of 70. And that's only midway through his life. And he spent 20 years at Laban's house. And the worst is yet to come. Would you want to mess up the rest of your life? I hope not. But many of us will say, no, no. But if you don't sit at the feet of Jesus, hear his voice and obey, you will end up like Jacob. And I hope not. God bless.